Good morning. Let's stand for our first song, Alive, Alive, Alive Forevermore. us. And um, just a few announcements before we get going. If you are new to Fairview, new around here, and you would like to know more about the church or uh, just have questions about that, April 7th, we are going to have a time during Sunday school for donuts and coffee. That'll be at 930 over in the gym. And we'll just have a few things to share with you about the church. And uh, again, if you want to be thinking about questions, um, it's not stump the pastor with theology time, but it, it, hopefully I can answer any questions you might have about the, the church. But um, also, if you would like to be baptized, if you've trusted in Jesus and would like to take the step of baptism, please let myself know or Dennis know. Uh, there's also an email address in the bulletin. If you would like to do that, let us know. Uh, we are going to have a discipleship class beginning here before too long, and there will be a baptism later this summer out at Rops Pond. So a few of you have already let me know you want to do that, and uh, but if you have, or if you know of anybody who would like to be baptized, please just let me know. Well, this morning, again, we are here because we serve a risen Savior. Uh, our Savior is alive. He did not stay in the grave. And Paul wrote in Romans 6, in relation to the power that's available to us in Christ, he says, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So today we uh, are not talking about a, an abstract story or a far out uh, doctrine that Jesus is alive. It's real and it is available and it is powerful in our lives today. So I trust that you're trusting in him. Uh, if you don't know Jesus, uh, we've been praying for you and pray that today would be the day that you might know the resurrected Savior. So at this time we're going to pray and then we'll continue on with our service. Father, uh, this morning, just praise your name, Lord. Thank you uh, for the the fact that we were dead in sin and transgression, that we were far from God, and yet we've been brought near because of the blood of Christ, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, and that today we can walk in newness of life. Whatever we're carrying in here today, uh, we know that you are present and available to anyone who would call on your name. And today, God, I pray, thank you for the time we've had already uh, as a sunrise service just fellowshipping around the truth of the empty tomb. And today, as we continue our worship, I pray, Father, uh, for your spirit to move among us, Lord, that your word would speak powerfully today. And we trust you to do this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Father, this morning, God, we praise your name. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, our God. And I pray, Father, that if they ask us how we know he lives, that we would be able to truthfully reply, he lives inside my heart. And today, Father, thank you that your strength is made perfect in weakness. And pray today, God, for your word to go forth in truth. I pray that you would guard my heart and my mind and ask, Father, that... Uh, we would go away more convinced than ever that you are alive in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. Uh, if you have a Bible, you can open that to Luke chapter 24. Going to be in there for a few minutes here on this Easter morning. And I don't know uh, where you're at with Easter. Maybe Easter's a new thing for you. Maybe as a maybe it's something that's been a part of your life, your whole life. As I believe this leader is still alive. It, it was not in a tomb. He was not just a great teacher. He's a savior who rose from the grave, walked out, and is alive today and still available to those who would believe. He's still working uh, in those of us who trust in him. And the offer of salvation is still held out. Out today. today in our text, we're going to read uh, a couple of different, really key words. You know, we're going to read of Jesus having risen, that they tell the story that, that the Lord is risen indeed. And that's a lifestyle. That's a way to live, that Jesus is alive. And that's one way to live your life. We're also going to see uh, that those who heard initially, that uh, to some of them, it seemed to them an idle tale. Some of your Bibles will say nonsense. It seemed preposterous that they would claim that this man was alive. And that's another way to live. That's another lifestyle way to walk things out. And you may say here today, I don't know where you're at. Many people sit in unbelief when it comes to things like the resurrection. Uh, it seems to them an idle tale, perhaps nonsense, and they reject it, uh, even mock it. But there's also another way in that the resurrection can be as it we're a, an idle tale that we can uh, claim it intellectually or maybe say we believe it but live indifferently in relation to it. That's another way for it to be an idle tale kind of lifestyle. Uh, so either he's arisen and he's alive today and that's real to you uh, or he hasn't. And that's really up to you. There's, I came to the realization this week that I can only convince someone to a point that Jesus is alive. I can only do so much. Uh, God has to ultimately move and do convincing in someone's heart uh, but the fact is, I think the burden of proof lays with the unbeliever because the tomb was empty. Like, the body wasn't there. So it's, it's not a far out leap uh, for us to believe that Jesus is alive. In fact, there's a lot of really good evidence. So we're going to touch on some of that today. Um, there's a couple of fill in the blanks in your bulletins this morning. You can fill those out if you would like. Uh, the resurrection is the greatest truth Satan wants to keep hidden. I really believe that. I believe that, uh, and I was thinking about this and talking with some of my family about it. You know, like, in reality, is truth is like, it's interdependent. Like, Jesus was born of a virgin. We celebrate that at Christmas. Uh, he rose from the dead. Uh, there's no gospel without both those things being true. Uh, so maybe it's not, maybe you don't think of it as some truth being uh, more powerful than others. But I think in light of what we live in, I think Satan, this would be the greatest truth that he would like to hide from you or have you not live in light of today if you do believe it. And that's the fact that Jesus is alive. One of my, actually, I think my favorite book throughout Bible college um, and seminary, this isn't working, there we go. Uh, Tim Keller wrote a book called The Reason for God. And in that, he's addressing skepticism. And he just goes through and acknowledges that there is people, there are people who have skepticism uh, regarding the Christian faith. And that's, that's okay, that happens. Uh, yet, he wrote some pretty powerful things, especially in relation to the resurrection. He said, the issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his, Jesus, teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. If it is true, it means we can't live our lives any way we want to. It also means we don't have to be afraid of anything. And he goes on to talk in there about uh, Roman crucifixion and death and 
sickness and all these things. We don't have to be afraid of anything. Uh, if Jesus rose from the dead, it changes everything. So I believe that's true. And if Jesus rose from the dead and it changes everything, wouldn't that be the one thing Satan wants to keep from you and hide from you? So today we're going to look at, we're not going to read the whole chapter of Luke 24. Um, again, I know some of you, you have small children and you sat through a sunrise service. You've been through Sunday school. Uh, patience is wearing thin. So I will try to honor that this morning. But uh, just powerful truths out of Luke's gospel narrative. Uh, Friday night, Good Friday, we left off uh, with the thought that it was the Sabbath rest according to the commandment. That we read through the crucifixion account, the death of Jesus and his burial. And these women, they had prepared spices and ointments. Uh, but because of the Sabbath, it was against the law for them to go and actually uh, put those on the body of Jesus. And so there was a Sabbath rest. And then today, we're going to pick it up in the beginning of Luke chapter 4. 24. We've been spending time in the gospel, or excuse me, the story of Acts as a church, the book of Acts. And today we go into the gospel narrative of Luke. Luke having written this book and Acts. So same author that we've been studying, different account, uh, diff account of different events. And it says, on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb. This is the women, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men, other accounts tell us they were angels, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their heads to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. Verse 10, now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna the Mary, the, and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. So these women, they've prepared, these, uh, they've prepared spices and ointments. There's at least five of them. There's Mary, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and other women. So more than one. Five of them, and they are the ones who return and report this news. It seems like an idle tale. The angel has told them, remember what he told you? Three times here, the words of Jesus, what he had spoken, are referenced. And Jesus had spoken all along that he would be put to death. And for some reason, you know, it didn't quite click. They, they believe, they know he's dead. They saw him go to the cross. They saw the life go out from him. There's no question in their mind that Jesus actually died. Key point, though, they did not find the body. They did not find the body. There's all kinds of theories, and I like to touch on these at Easter time because they're so meaningful to me. Um, I don't know if they are to you either, but there's only so many possible things that could have happened there. The tomb was empty. That's no reasonable thinker argues that. People don't debate that. The why it was empty is sort of the question. And there's the whole theory of, you know, Jesus, they stole his body. That his disciples came and stole his body, which um, they, according to... To the other accounts, they were in no mental place to be doing this. They were afraid. They were locked in an upper room. Um, they had gone away from this scene. There was Roman guards. They didn't seem to be in the mindset to take on Roman guards and steal a body. Uh, there's theories that other people took it, but really all that has to be done there is for the body to be presented. 
that if the body was stolen, somebody knows where it is. It turns up. People think maybe they went to the wrong tomb, uh, which would be possible. Maybe these women went to the wrong tomb. That could happen. But it would also mean that Peter went to the wrong tomb. It would mean the angels went to the wrong tomb. I mean, many things. It would mean Joseph of Arimathea, the rich man who donated the tomb, would not have been able to set it straight. And believe me, in this time, if he owned a tomb, he knew exactly where his property was. So I don't, I don't think that one holds up. There's different ideas that maybe he didn't really die, which if you know anything about Roman crucifixion, uh, some people didn't survive the beatings leading to the cross. And somehow there's a theory that in a cold, damp tomb, apart from any medical intervention for hours on end, Jesus somehow revived, moved a stone, and walked out. I guess it could be, but I don't know. That's prob- Again, I think the burden of proof is on people who say that he didn't raise from the dead. And I don't mean to mock or dismiss skepticism. I've had my share of my own in it in my life. But at some point, you come face to face with history. And I'm not talking about just the Bible. There's uh, historians who wrote outside of the scriptures of the man Jesus. There's so much pointed to throughout history. And yet we can kind of leave the resurrection in a realm of impossibility or in a realm of imagination. Um, We live in a world of artificial intelligence. I don't know if you know this, but if you missed Elvis Presley, he's back on tour. (laughs) Has anyone seen this? This, With artificial intelligence and uh, holographic imaging, they are creating the king again. And you can go see him perform. It's, it's, It's weird. It's scary. Artificial intelligence, we're not going to go down that path today. But there is a reality when we can sort of relegate things like the resurrection to the same sorts of categories. Well, I have to see it to believe it. We'll talk about that in a second. But the fact is uh, that There is so much that has to be answered for. And to be honest, if you are considering life and the deeper questions of life, to simply dismiss it as unimportant isn't reality. You have to do something with Jesus. You have to do something with the empty tomb. And today, I trust you're here celebrating the fact that uh, as we sang, I know he lives because he lives inside my heart. That is not sort of uh, a whimsical, warm, fuzzy feeling, although it can be at times. But there's times when you will feel nothing at all. But you've reached a point of there's more reasons to believe than not to believe. And the tomb was empty. This is an area that Satan attacks. Again, I want to frame it as this is a primary uh, point in thinking, point in history, point in theology, point in understanding that Satan would love for you to dismiss whether you're a believer in Jesus or not a believer. He would love for you never to consider this one. And he'll attack all the evidence he can, uh, whether it's your own reasoning. And again, just before we move on from this thought, to sit here today and think because we have a uh, silly artificial intelligence uh, in our day that we have what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery, that these people in the first century didn't know what they were seeing. I'll tell you what, the idea of someone walking out of a grave was as foreign to them as it is to us today. I'm not making that up. That's just, that was the culture of the day. It wasn't like, ooh, they're ancient minds and they just think people walk out of the grave. Um, They might have been less convinced than we even would. So let's not be arrogant in our modern times and dismiss uh, all the history that points to Jesus that we have, we believe in so many historical figures that have far less written about them, far less evidence for them. You must do something with Jesus. This is a point where, uh, again, maybe I'm Crazy preacher talking about the unseen world today, but there is an enemy of your soul who would love to just never let you consider that. Uh, He's going to attack your understanding as well. After Jesus, after this encounter, after Peter goes and sees and returns home marveling, we have this wonderful story that Luke records One of the longest, if not longest, stories in the Gospel of Luke, the road to Emmaus. We won't read the whole thing, but uh, it, it goes that there are these followers of Jesus. It's that very day, Luke tells us in verse 13, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about a seven mile journey from Jerusalem. 
And while they're talking and discussing together, Luke records, it says, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Okay, so Jesus is revealing, hiding himself. And again, one of the things that so many people have ideas about, how did he hide himself? We're not told. It's not the point. He's not revealing who he is. And I love the thought of Jesus just listening. What are these guys going to say? And their conversation continues, and Luke records that, and he asks what they're talking about. and what, They ask him, how can you be here and not know the events that have happened? This is, how can you, where are you from? And Jesus asks a question, he says, what things? <laughs> this is the guy that was beaten, that went to the cross, that died, and he just kind of wants to hear it from them, I guess. But they go on and they relay the events, they relay the accounts. They say, it is now the third day. So this is, this is the same day. This is now the third day. And they say again, they did not find his body. Already the question is beginning. There was a dead man, and no one knows where he went. Jesus speaks to them, and he says, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe what the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then it says, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, just referencing the Old Testament as a whole, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now they still don't see it and they still don't understand it, but he's interpreting the scriptures to them and it's not ringing a bell. Do you see the power of, of what you see over what you believe? Like it's not coming back to them the words that uh, the angel had told the ladies, you know, remember what he told you. And the ladies remembered his words, but these guys, they're not piecing it together. There is a, a clouded understanding that's happening. And as they continue on, they get near the village. And again, Jesus, he, he acts like he's going to continue on. I, just, I, I, I love how Jesus just plays it out, lets it play out. Picking up in verse 30, though, it says, He was at table with them. He took the bread. So Jesus receives their invitation. He goes into their house. He takes the bread and blessed it and broke it. Reminiscent of the feeding of the 5,000 Reminiscent of the Last Supper, Good Friday, what we celebrated, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. We celebrated the blood and the body of Christ, that he gave it to us. And something in this moment, it says in verse 31, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They recognize him, he disappears, and they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. They told, then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So in this moment and in this uh, where he, they realize who he is and all of a sudden they're thinking back. Yeah, our hearts were burning as he opened the scriptures to us. Well, no kidding. He's talking about himself. There's this, the power of what they believe has happened and what has happened. They have not connected the dots. And Jesus, like I said, is not revealing himself to them. But there's also a fact that the enemy of your soul would love to hide scripture from your mind. He would love to hide the idea of the resurrection from your mind. He would love for you never to know what it is for the spirit of God to burn in you through the word, through the scriptures, through the things, the words, the writings that testify to who Jesus was and what happened to him. It's the greatest truth that Satan would love for you not to believe, not to walk in, not to know is true and would love to keep you looking in all the wrong places for all the wrong things and finding all the wrong results. A number of years ago, I was golfing with a friend. I won't say his name, but it rhymes with Kyle Cox. And we were out on the golf course and it was a fun day and we went to tee off and that hole was, I'd never seen a hole that far away. I was like, that's 600 yards that's ridiculous. Well, what do you do? We tee up and start shooting. We turn to our side. We see a groundskeeper, and he goes like that. And we turned around, and the hole was very close. We were aiming at the wrong one. 
It's very dangerous when there's other people in the course. Uh, anyway, point is, if you're facing the wrong direction, looking in the wrong places, and then wonder why God doesn't reveal himself, open your eyes to truth. Again, the burden of proof, I don't believe this morning is on the believer for the empty tomb. I think the burden on, of proof is the one who rejects it. Why do we reject it? Why do people reject it? Why do they reject Christianity? All other religions, no matter how you look at it, has to do with self-promotion. There's always a climbing of the ladder. There's always a, a seeking. You can just look into any, any one you want, and there's just always a way that you are climbing a ladder. You're getting more and more close to God, more and more uh, advanced in any given religion that it may be. It's still about self-promotion. You may want to put to death today the idea of the reality of a risen Savior, the reality of the truth of the Scriptures, the reality that has changed and transformed so many people. You may want to do that today simply because that if, as Keller wrote, Jesus is alive, then that implies and commands certain things of you. That what you feel and what you want and what your body desires might not be the ultimate end in life. That pleasure and self-fulfillment might actually be death. And it's only in the gospel, it's only in Christianity that, that God uh, doesn't say, work your way up the mountain to me and become God-like. He says, you are not God-like and I will come down the mountain to you. Thus, crucifixion, Jesus emptying himself of everything that made him God. This is the reason the world hates Christianity, because if it's true, it demands certain things of us, yet those of us who believe in it know that as the disciples, when Jesus, when the crowds left because it was hard, because it commanded something of them, and he said, do you want to leave too? They looked at him and said, you alone have the words of eternal life. Yes, it is hard. And Jesus said, they will hate you because they hated me. Uh, it's, it's not an easy road following Jesus. It's not a fix all to follow Jesus. Anyone who tells you that is lying to you or doesn't know Jesus. But it is the only way to eternal life. And Satan would love to cloud your mind, would love to hold you back from the scriptures being opened, the truth of God's word, the anchor of thousands of years and generations of people who have banked their very souls on its teaching. And Satan would love to block that from your mind. Luke continues, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? My hands, see my hands and my feet. That it is I myself, touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still believed, they still disbelieved for joy. That's a fascinating line. They disbelieved for joy. Basically, they're, they can't believe what they're seeing. And were marveling. He said to them, have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. What an interesting detail. Uh, a piece of broiled fish. Jesus, when he appeared to the seven disciples in John 21, Jesus is inviting them. He says, come have breakfast. What is it with Jesus and eating and the appearance and the resurrection of Jesus? It's because he's alive in the flesh. He's alive in the physical. He's taking in food because he's hungry. It's just, I love the words broiled fish in Luke's account. Maybe that's not what overwhelmed you with joy this Christmas Eve. Christmas, <laughs> it is Easter. I'm sorry, it was an early morning. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, Easter. But it's, he's alive. He's physically alive. And that's why there's these accounts. And I referenced, I believe, last week, uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians of how, you know, 500 people, Jesus appeared to 500 different people. Do you know Paul wrote those words 15 to 20 years after these events? Like, not everybody died. Like, they still were like, Purdue, let's, there's, where's this body? 
Paul hangs it out there with his credentials, with his testimony, everything. He says, this man appeared to 500 people, many of whom are still alive. Physically, he appeared, eating broiled fish and food with people. And blessed are those. See, it was Thomas. Thomas was a man who found this hard to believe. Skepticism uh, had gotten a hold of him. He hadn't read Keller's reasons for God. He was struggling to believe. He said, unless I see with my hands the marks and nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. This is eight days later. Thomas is saying, show me the body. Jesus appears, and listen to what he says, blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. That's us here this morning, that there is a blessing. Yes, we don't see Jesus in the physical, but we do believe we are ankled, anchored to truth. Satan will attack your mind with an I will believe it when I see it sort of mentality. He would love for you to hold on to that, Believe this world is only physical, it's only natural. And that supernatural things don't happen. Christianity is based on a supernatural event, the reality that Jesus walked out of a tomb. Luke continues on. Then he, Jesus, said to them, these are my words that I have spoken to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Here it is again. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things and behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the ultimate Bible study (laughs) And the law and the prophets and the Psalms, that Jesus opens their minds to understand it. Perhaps he talked about Psalm 22, written a thousand years before Roman crucifixion was even invented, where it talks about the piercing of his hands. Maybe it was Isaiah 52 and 53, 700 years before these events, that uh, he said he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. Maybe it was Zachariah's words that they would look upon the one whom they had pierced and weep 500 years before these events. But in a moment of clarity and understanding, he opens their hearts and their minds to the reality that all these things were talking about me long before they possibly could have been talking about me unless somehow it really is the word of God and I really am the son of God and I really am alive And he gives them a promise. Satan would love to attack your mind regarding the word of God and the things written about Jesus. They're struggling with belief. They're struggling to wrap their heads around what's happened. Jesus goes to the scriptures. He goes to the word. The combination of the word and the fact that he's alive radically changes these people. And they go. Again, here's our link to Acts. We'll be back in Acts next week. But this is, he's, he's telling them, wait, I am sending the promise. That's the Holy Spirit. I will send the Holy Spirit upon you, but wait. What I find interesting and fascinating is that uh, Jesus doesn't say The pain is over. Eternity's here. This is going to be easy from here on out. What struck me as I was reading this, I have really thought about this before, but uh, Luke gives us the account of the ascension, which is very key. It's a key bridge to his, when he writes uh, the narrative of Acts. But he closes, he brings us... uh, closes his gospel with some interesting words that, and he led them out as far as Bethany, lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up to heaven. Now this this is the part, listen to this. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. 
and we're continually in the temple blessing God. They didn't head for the hills. They didn't head. They head back to the place of execution. They head back to the place where the very men who saw to it that Jesus breathed his last were still alive and well, maybe rejoicing in the fact that they had carried out their plan. They return with great joy. And I think this is where the resurrection becomes incredibly powerful and incredibly real because it calls our minds out and beyond the physical, out and beyond our circumstance, out and beyond the limited uh, thinking that we have and into the unimaginable and radically paradigm-shifting realities of what it means for us if Jesus is alive. And that's why today, the next blank that you have there is that this is the greatest truth that you can live in light of. Can you take me to the John passage, please? John, in John, we read of the story of the death of Lazarus. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is telling Martha that after she has buried her brother, that the physical, the world around her, has taken her to a place of unimaginable grief, of unimaginable pain, And Martha responds, she says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And that's where it sits for many of us. The last day, it'll affect the last day. It'll affect the last day, the resurrection. Of course, Jesus is coming back. She's thinking, she has thinking of a Messiah returning of the last day. She has some sort of idea of a resurrection of life where uh, everyone who's in the grave and the tomb would be risen to life again. She has an understanding of that. But Jesus, in his wisdom and in his love, says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Then he asks her, do you believe this? It's one of the great I am statements of Jesus where he's equating himself. He is God. He is the great I am. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. What he's doing is welcoming Martha in from uh, maybe a story she heard her whole life of a coming resurrection at the end of time. And he's bringing it in very near and very personal. He's saying, I am the resurrection and the life. That it's not far out there, that it is in me. And it's found in relation to me. And in this darkest moment of death and burial, I am the resurrection. And I'm going to prove it to you. And Lazarus walks out of the tomb, right? People die. People get sick. People are wounded. People wound. Jesus makes a point by raising Lazarus from the dead, but he doesn't always do that in the physical. But he is still the place where resurrection is found. 1952, there was a lady named Florence Chadwick stepped into the waters off the Pacific Ocean of Catalina Island, determined to swim to the shore of California. She'd already been the first woman to swim the English Channel both ways. And the weather was foggy and chilly on this morning in 1952. She was flanked by boats beside and behind to watch for sharks as she swam. And she swam and swam through fog, thick, dark fog. Story goes, she was physically and emotionally exhausted 
She stopped swimming, but her mom kept encouraging her to keep going, keep going, and she kept fighting and fighting as long as she could until she couldn't do it anymore and was pulled out of the water. It wasn't until she was back on the boat that she realized the shore was only less than half a mile away. At a news conference the next day, she said, all I could see was the fog. She said, I think I could have seen the shore. If I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. Two months later, she tried again, and there was fog again, but this time she succeeded in reaching the shore. She said then that she kept a mental image of the shoreline in her mind while she swam and completed her goal. And today, the fog of doubt, the fog of, sec- of uh, skepticism, the fog of circumstance, whatever it may be, might just be clouding your view of a risen Savior, of a risen Lord, of a Jesus who walks out of a tomb, and a Jesus who changes lives, Jesus who doesn't always fix our circumstances, but a Jesus who still looks at us and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection. I think today he calls us in the same way he called Mary to take the resurrection out of an abstract theology, out of something maybe we read in a book and to say that we believe. He's asking us today, do you believe I am the way? Do you believe I am the resurrection? And as the fog of life may surround us at times that it's the reality that this world, this physical, is temporary. Jesus proved it by walking out of the grave. He proved it by the fact that the tomb is empty and the invitation still stands. And today we can continue to live as though it were an idle tale. Or we can lean into and walk in the reality that he is the risen Lord, he is the risen Savior. And again, perhaps you're like a man wrestling with his belief in the Gospels and said, I believe, help my unbelief. That's okay. Ask the questions. Seek truth above all else at all costs and realize that, again, the resurrection is the greatest truth you need in your life. It's the greatest truth the enemy will fight against. It's the greatest truth that he would love for you to forget tomorrow morning. Because the resurrection and Jesus and the gospel as laid out in the pages of the Bible are the only anchor for the soul, the only cleansing for the mind, and the only hope for eternity. And it's true today because the tomb is empty. Would you stand with me? And let's pray, Lord, today. What a beautiful truth we celebrate. What a beautiful reality. God, that the ultimate gift was given. That you gave your son who died on a cross in our place and didn't stay dead but rose to life that we too might walk in newness of life. And today, Father, if anybody's wrestling with this truth or this reality, I ask that you would give them the courage, Father, to talk to someone. Maybe they've been in church their whole lives and just do not live in the reality of the resurrection. Lord, I pray that you would draw them to yourself today. And maybe today the the realities of life and the questions and the answers that may or may not come are clouding the thinking in the mind. God, I pray that you would open the scriptures, open the spirit, lead us into your ways. Father, give us faith that we may live, as Paul wrote, by your energy and not by ours. Thank you for the gospel this morning, the good news of the love of God. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you. You are dismissed.